Good evening. Namaskar. Thank you for tuning in to this presentation of the Infosys Prize 2021. My name is Deepak Padaki, and I am joining you live from the green, lovely Infosys campus here in Bengaluru. Well, of course, we would have loved it if each one of you was here in person to enjoy this event with us. But owing to the uncertainties of the pandemic, and more importantly, the safety protocols that we must all be adhering to at this time, we bring you the excitement of this evening in this virtual format. Well, today, we are going to be celebrating accomplishments that span a diverse set of topics. From the history of the Portuguese in Goa, to the ecology of tropical savannas, from the strong nuclear forces in atomic particles to issues around gender-based violence, from algebraic complexities to the all-too-familiar RT-PCR testing. Indeed, the work of our winners in this year's Infosys Prize reflect the deep connectedness between science and society. Join me now to watch a short video that captures this thought. Disease, climate catastrophes, malicious misinformation. These problems have been created by humans. We are beyond taking small steps to solve them. We need to come together and do something big. And if we don't do anything, these calamities may wipe humanity off the planet along with the ecosystems we depend on. Now, our planet depends on us. Its survival and our success are linked. Delving, finding, testing, restarting. Scientifically thinking about the problems that confront us is only way we may get there. Not to some distant part of our solar system or another galaxy, but here, to a greener, cleaner home. This is a message of hope. Look at how much we have achieved already from thinking to doing. From being victims of mass famine and hunger to crafting policies that drive poverty out the door. From thinking about nuclear force to understanding how to harness it for cleaner fuel and figuring out its workings inside the stars we will someday soon explore. From wondering about the origin of our species, to sequencing genomes to find cures for deadly diseases. While we ponder if we exist in isolation, alone in the universe, we've also leveraged virtual reality to collaborate in the metaverse. The curiosity to explore and a spirit to endure shines bright. Though not all of us can see that light, we must find and encourage those who do. We really don't have to look that far. The Infosys Prize celebrates the success of those who shine bright as beacons showing us the way, not just on work that matters today. Welcome to Infosys Prize 2021. Wow, so much has been done, but there's still so much more to discover, to understand, and to act upon. Our first speaker this evening is passionate about science, about applying it to the most pressing problems of society, about nurturing small ideas that will one day have a big impact. For his opening remarks, please welcome the president of the Infosys Science Foundation, Mr. S. Gopalakrishnan. Good evening, Mr. Gopal Krishnan. Welcome to the program, and I hand the floor to you. Thank you, Deepak. Good evening to all, and welcome to the Infosys Prize 2021 virtual award ceremony. Like last year, this year also, we are conducting the event 
virtually. And I'm glad that you could join us to hear the names of the winners of the Infosys Prize being announced now. Professor Gaganti Kang, the chief guest for today's evening, trustees of Infosys Science Foundation, the jury chairs, jury members, this year's winners of Infosys Prize and their families, past winners, well-wishers of Infosys Science Foundation, friends of science, members of uh, media and press, and press, ladies and gentlemen. Today is an evening to celebrate uh, science uh, and, and we're doing this um, in the period that a pandemic is, um, is impacting the world. And, you know, the, the need for science, the, the, the role played by science and technology is recognized even more during the pandemic. And in fact, the, the role of scientists, engineers, clearly has been understood by society. At Infosys Science Foundation, it is our endeavor to actually recognize scientists, create awareness about the work that is being done by these people, create icons and role models of these scientists so that it inspires a new generation of scientists to come forward and do world-class work and to make sure that their work, the winner's work, is communicated, their impact is communicated to society and, and there is appreciation for their work. I'm very glad that all of you could join today. I'm thankful to all the jury uh, members, uh, all the people who applied for this award this year, and all of you, you know, because of you, we know that uh, there is appreciation for world-class science in India. I firmly believe that uh, India has an important role to play in the world of research. More people doing research hopefully will get the problem solved faster. The cost of doing research in India is lower. For every $5 spent outside, in especially developed countries, $1 spent in India actually Can doubles the research output. India represents 20% of the world's population. And to solve any problem, any global problem, representation of India's diversity must be there in order for the solution to work for the entire humanity. Last but not the least, the diversity of thoughts, cultures, hopefully will bring a better solution to the world. So let me congratulate all the laureates, all the winners in advance, and let's now move on to the award ceremony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gopal Krishnan, for setting that context and highlighting the quest of the foundation and, of course, the Infosys Prize. The Infosys Prize itself consists of a gold medal, a citation, and a purse of 100,000 US dollars in each of its six categories. Every year, we receive hundreds of nominations for the prize, and we have eminent juries in each category comprising of renowned researchers who pick our winners. All right, let's get down to the first category of this evening, which is engineering and computer science.
To introduce the jury chair for this category, it is my pleasure to invite a co-founder of Infosys, S.D. Shibulat. Good evening, Mr. Shibulal. Welcome to the program. And I'll hand it to you to introduce the jury chair for engineering and computer science. Good afternoon, everyone. I am privileged to introduce you to the jury chair of the Infosys Prize in Engineering and Computer Science, Professor Aravind. Professor Aravind is a Johnson Professor of Computer Science and Engineering and the head of computer science faculty at MIT, where he joined in 1978. After graduating with a BTEC in electrical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, Professor Aravind went on to earn his MS and PhD in computer science from the University of Minnesota. He put his technology and entrepreneurial skills to use and in 2000, he founded Sandbus, a fabulous semiconductor company. And in 2003, he co-founded BlueSpec Incorporated. Professor Aravind was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Engineering in 2008 and has received numerous awards and honors, including IEEE Charles Bobbage Outstanding Scientist Award in 1994 and the IEEE Computer Science Harriet Ford Memorial Award in 2012. I now request Professor Aravind to announce the Infosys Prize winner in the Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shibulal. Um, uh, I'm pleased to announce the winner of Infosys Prize in Engineering and Computer Science is Dr. Chandrasekhar Nair, founder and CTO of Mole Biodiagnostics in Bangalore. Why was he chosen? In 1993, Professor Kari Mullis was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his invention of polymerase chain reaction or PCR method that enables direct testing of genes from patient samples. PCR has become the gold standard for testing many infectious diseases, such as tuberculosis, dengue fever, uh, chikungunya, H1N1, hepatitis, and many others. Okay. However, the cost and workflow complexity of PCR testing platforms have restricted its use to sophisticated labs and uh, in larger cities. Dr. Chandrasekhar Nair, has created a battery-operated, rugged, portable PCR device called TrueNAT that requires minimal training and can be deployed at scale in resource-limited settings. Uh, TrueNAT uh, produces results in an hour, and currently 30 different diseases can be tested just by changing the cartridge in the platform. Dr. Nair has achieved what many global competitors have been struggling to do for over two decades. TrueNAT has reduced the diagnostic window for testing TB from six months to three weeks after the onset of TB symptoms. This has enabled immediate treatment and reduced the community spread of a disease that claims one death every minute in India. TrueNAT is now the only point of care platform approved by WHO for TB detection globally. Using TrueNet, India was able to increase its testing capability for COVID-19 from 100 locations to over 4,000 locations in states with poor medical infrastructure in a very short period of time. By now, 8 million COVID tests have been performed on TrueNet platforms. It also leverages India's mobile network for automatic data roll-up to national programs, and that enables detection 
of areas where the disease first appears. TrueNet has been field validated in several countries by independent agencies like the Foundation of Innovative Diagnostics Switzerland. It is currently being deployed in 10 resource limited countries across Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Uh, Dr. Nair has demonstrated multidisciplinary skills diagnostic assay development to make a successful commercial product. Dr. Nair's journey has involved working with India's nascent medical device manufacturing ecosystem and eventually setting up state-of-the-art facilities for manufacturing high-precision plastic test combustible consumables. Uh, his development and successful deployment at scale of TrueNet is the hallmark of innovation and true engineering. Now let me say a word about the process. So uh, Dr. Nair was selected by a jury of international experts comprised of Dr. Kaushik Bhattacharya, Vice Provost Caltech, Dr. Dhananjay Dhaninpuri, founder Archia Labs, Dr. Sudhir Jain, Director IIT Gandhinagar, Professor Jitendra Malik, uh, UC Berkeley, Professor Jayati Murthy, Dean of Engineering, UCLA. We chose Dr. Nair after 13 Zoom meetings over three months. During this period, we also consulted uh, several other experts, external experts, to fully understand the technical depth and impact of his work. Congratulations, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Nair, for dedicating 20 years of your life to develop this crucial technology for healthcare. Dr. Nair, I'd like you to say a few words. A big thank you to the Infosys Science Foundation, to Professor Arvind and the jury for recognizing what has been a massive team and collaborative effort spanning two decades. I would like to thank my many mentors, Professor P. R. Krishnaswamy, uh, Professor uh, P. B. Subarao, and Dr. B. K. Iyer among them. The big tech founding members, Kini, Sam, My partner in Malbayo, Sridham, who has made TrueNAT the commercial success that it is today. My team for believing in the dream of TrueNAT and executing this tremendous multidisciplinary engineering effort, starting from goal seeking, design, prototyping, precision high volume manufacturing, validation, regulatory, and of course, sales and support that has helped create technology and tremendous impact and very timely impact at the time when India and the world needed this the most. I would like to thank my father, who is no longer physically with us, my mother, Tangam. I am. I would like to thank my daughter, Aditi, and the most and not the least is my Ardangini, Anita, for bearing with all the physical and mental absence that uh, they bared with when I was busy pursuing my dream. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chibulal. Thank you, Professor Arvind, and congratulations, Prof. can't imagine what goes in terms of dedication and hard work to come up with innovations that make the world a safer place. Thank you once again, Professor Nair. We move on now to our second category, which is humanities. To introduce the jury chair for this category of invite the anchor trustee for this category, the chairman of Infosys, Mr. Nandan Nilakini.
Good evening, Mr. Nilakani. Welcome to the program. And I hand it to you to introduce the jury chair. Uh, thank you, Deepak. And I'm privileged to introduce you to the jury chair of the Infosys Prize for Humanity in Humanities, Professor Akhil Bilgrami. Professor Bilgrami is a philosopher of mind and language, and he's a Sydney Morgan Besser Professor of Philosophy at Columbia University. He was educated at Elphinstone College, Mumbai, and was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, where he did his PPE and later on went and did a PhD at the University of Chicago. He has written many seminal books on philosophy, and he is here today as the chair of the jury. I request Professor Bilgrami to announce the Infosys Prize winner in Humanities. I'm very pleased to announce that the winner of the Infosys Prize in Humanities this year is Dr. Angela Moreto Xavier from the University of Lisbon in Portugal. The jurors for this award were Professors Bartha Mitter, Janet Giazzo, David Schulman, Sanjay Subramaniam, and myself. We chose Dr. Xavier for her superb accounts of different aspects of the Portuguese empire in India her extensive body of work in both English and Portuguese have shown her to be an important and original voice in Indian history of the colonial period. Dr. Shavi's writings are remarkable, both for their meticulous archival research and for the highly illuminating theoretical framework within which its findings are given explanatory power and depth. Her work on Catholic Orientalism penetrates and systematically explores hitherto inaccessible and dispersed archives and overcomes Protestant dominated legacies of British scholarship to reveal the vast range of knowledge of South Asia that was accumulated by Catholics working within the framework of Portugal's Asian empire. Her other major work Religion and Empire in Portuguese India is a definitive contribution to understanding the role of conversion in the construction of the identity of the entire region of Goa. Its subtle and fine-grained detail brings out the diversity of roles as well as of the attitudes and motivations among the various social classes, both among the rulers and the ruled, in the processes of Christianization of that region. It is sensitive to the part played by many institutions of civil society, from education to charity. It records with care and understanding the tense interplay of both acquiescence and resistance in the segmented native populations. And it is fair-minded throughout in displaying the unresolved mixture of violence and domination in the midst of fruitful engagement and mutual influence between the colonizer and the colonized. All of this amounts to the portrait of a whole society and colonial culture, a scholarly achievement that amply deserves the recognition bestowed by this major prize from the Infosys Foundation. And each one of us jurors would like to say to Angela that we hope that this award will inspire you in the work you have planned in the coming years, which we are all eager to read. So congratulations, Angela. And would you now say a few words of acceptance? Professor Akil Bilgrani, for your generous and kind words. 
all the jury members for their recognition. And of course, we Infosys Science Foundation, which activities are just the ones I would li like to do in my life. I'm delighted to be here, and it is a great honor to be included in this group of laureates of the Infosys Prize. I'm also aware that my good fortune depends on colleagues, friends, family, my husband and children. Since I cannot mention all of them, I will only refer to my, to the late Antonio Manuel Spanha, my wonderful mentor, and training, Kisti Chaudhuri for these intriguing questions, Sanjay Subramaniam and Inir Supanov whose work is always an inspiration. Sincerely, I have been interested in understanding the mechanisms behind exclusion and the relationship to identity making. Due to the immensity of variables in motion, imperial and religious most relevant sites of analysis. In that sense, Goa has been a case study to study even understand bigger problems, problems that have affected millions and millions of people in the past and still today in India and elsewhere. And Goa is also a good place to understand that ourselves, sometimes unconsciously, are co-responsible in this process. Many, many thanks and namaste. What a fantastic endorsement of our winner's work from the jury. So once again, here is the Infosys Prize in the category of Life Sciences. And to introduce the jury chair in Life Sciences, once again, may I call upon Mr. S.D. Shibulal. Mr. Shibulal, over to you once again, and I'm sorry that you have to do this again. Good evening, everyone. I am privileged to introduce you to the jury chair of the Infosys Prize in Life Sciences, Professor Nadan Gasur. Professor Gasur is the Newton Professor of Neuroscience and the director of the Simon Center for Social Brain and an investigator at the Pekor Institute of Learning and Memory at MIT. He is well known for his fundamental discoveries on the cortical plasticity, including principles by which the brain changes as it develops and as we learn and remember. He has received Distinguished Aluminous Award from IIT Kanpur, where he received his BTEC, and from Vanderbilt University, where he received his PhD. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of the UK and the National Academy of Medicine of the US. His most recent award is the Craig Cortical Discoverer Prize. I now request Professor Sur to announce the Infosys Prize winner in the life sciences. Thank you, Shibu. I'm pleased to announce that the 2021 Infosys Prize in Life Sciences is awarded to Professor Mahesh Sankaran of the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore. The prize is given to Professor Sankaran in recognition of his pioneering work 
on the ecology of tropical savanna ecosystems. His contributions to highlighting the biodiversity of important Indian ecosystems, such as the Western Ghats, and his leading role in international reports on climate change and biodiversity that are providing scientific evidence to policymakers nationally and internationally. Ecology is often less celebrated than other areas of life sciences, yet it is critical to the future of our planet, especially now that human development is accelerating climate change and causing ecosystem degradation at an unprecedented rate. Tropical savannas, which are dominated by grasses and sparse trees, cover large regions of Africa, Asia, South America, and Australia, and are known for their biodiversity. Their ecology was relatively neglected until a team led by Professor Sankaran collected extensive data for African savannas and quantified the impact of multiple factors on their biodiversity and tree cover. His pioneering contributions revealed that tropical savannas are more complex than previously realized. By combining modeling and field experiments, he showed that savannas exist in stable and unstable forms and that the switch between them is determined by rainfall. Professor Sankaran built collaborations with international teams that analyzed tropical savannas worldwide with a particular focus on India. The work of Indian teams led by Professor Sankaran revealed that the Western Ghats are a unique ecosystem with critical roles in preserving biodiversity and sequestering carbon. Professor Sankaran is an important contributor to influential international reports on biodiversity on biodiversity and climate change, which have raised the dual crises of biodiversity loss and climate change to the top of the international agenda. He was a section lead for the recently released report prepared by 50 of the world's leading climate and biodiversity scientists and co-sponsored by the Intergovernmental Program on Climate Change or IPCC and the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity, or IPBES, on the importance of tackling the climate and biodiversity crises together, while also addressing their combined societal impact. Professor Sankaran is thus at the leading edge of a new wave of Indian ecologists and ecosystem scientists who are reshaping the way both India and the world view ecosystems and their relationship to climate change. His work is crucial for shaping national and international policy. And we look forward to his continued leadership on these critical issues of our time. Professor Sankaran was unanimously selected for the 2021 prize by a distinguished jury consisting of Vishwa Dixit of Genentech, Akiko Iwasaki of Yale School of Medicine, Jane Langdale of Oxford University, Timothy Mitchison of Harvard University, and Shubha Tole of the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research. So congratulations, Mahesh. And I invite you now to say a few words. Thank you, Professor Sur, the jury, and the Infosys Science Foundation uh, for valuing and appreciating our work and for this award. It's indeed an honor and a privilege to be recognized alongside such a distinguished and eminent group of laureates, both past and present. I have many people that I need to thank who've been an instrumental part of my journey, both professional and personal, over the years. My mentors uh, at the master's and PhD level, the extraordinary group of colleagues and collaborators from across the globe, and the amazing 
and game guards that I have uh, been privileged enough to work with over the years. They've all been instrumental in shaping the scientist that I am today and the field biologist that I am today. Uh, I would also, of course, my students, both past and present, they've been amazing. They've, uh, students and postdocs, they've challenged me, they've sometimes confused me, uh, but more often than not, they've inspired me. And I have learned so much from them, and I think I've become a better scientist and hopefully a better person too uh, for it. I would also like to thank NCBS for being such a supportive and stimulating environment and for making science that much easier to do. And closer to home, I would like to thank my parents for being very supportive of my choices. Jayashree Ratnam, partner, friend and collaborator and who's co-created much of this work with me. And I think this award is as much a recognition of her uh, contributions to the field as it is mine. And finally, I'd also like to thank our son, Sadat Shankaran, who's come out to the field with us since he was nine months old and in a sling, and who's braved everything from ticks and thorns to elephants and leeches and helped us collect data. This one is for all of them. Uh, I'd like to end by saying that it's really encouraging to see that the Life Sciences Prize this year has gone in the field of the ecological sciences. As Professor Sur mentioned, we are dealing with the dual crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss. And addressing these challenges will require some very creative solutions, and these need to be fast. And I have been privileged to witness the emergence, if you will, of an amazing cadre of young, world-class ecologists over the last few years, both in academia and in uh, the conservation NGOs. And I sincerely hope that this award will to ensure that these young scientists get all the support that they need early on in their careers so that they can go ahead and do all the wonderful work that they're destined to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Shubilal, and congratulations, Professor Sankaran. Thank you. Isn't it wonderful to see ecology celebrated? A domain of research that is often neglected, and like Professor Sur said, so important to the future of our planet and its complex ecosystems. Well, complexity is not something that our next laureate shies from in the category of mathematical sciences. And to introduce the jury chair for mathematical sciences, it is my pleasure to invite the anchor trustee for this category and a co-founder of Infosys, Mr. K. Dinesh. Good evening, Mr. Dinesh. Welcome to the program, and I hand the floor to you. Thanks, Deepak, and uh, good evening to all of you. Good morning to those of you in uh, different parts of the world. I am really privileged to introduce you to the jury chair of the Infosys Prize in Mathematical Sciences, Professor Chandrasekhar Khare. Chandrasekhar Khare is the David Saxon Presidential Term Chair in Mathematics at the University of California, Los Angeles. He is a renowned number theorist, and his work with Joe Fair Winterberger gave a proof of a celebrated conjecture of J.P. Sell in number theory. The conjecture had remained unsolved for more than three decades after it was first formulated until these two gentlemen solved it. He has received a number of honors and awards, including the coveted Fermat Prize in 2007, in our own Infosys Prize in 2010, Humboldt Research Award, and the Cole Prize in 2011. He was invited speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians in 2010 and was elected a fellow of the Royal Society 
in 2012. Now, may I request Professor Kare to announce the Infosys Prize winner in the Queen of Sciences, the Mathematical Sciences. Thank you, Mr. Dinesh, for the kind introduction. It's my great pleasure to announce the Infosys Prize winner for Mathematical Sciences uh, this year. It's Dr. Neeraj Kayal of Microsoft University of Bangalore for his outstanding contributions to computational complexity. In particular, Kayal's extensive innovative work on algebraic computation includes the development of deep verb bound techniques, moving limitations of this natural model. Neeraj's deep work in theoretical computer science tackles the hardest problems in the field. His work in algebraic complexity theory has been very impactful and forges new connections with classical mathematical fields, like number theory, and algebraic geometry. He has worked with many of his young colleagues and senior researchers in the country, an important center in the field of complexity. I would like to uh, announce the jury members who uh, were in part of this process of uh, arriving at the Neeraj as the winner. We had a very distinguished jury, uh, Rajiva Karandikar, former director of the Chennai Mathematical Institute, uh, Raman Parimala, a very distinguished algebraist who works at Emory and formerly at TIFR. Avi Vidgarsen, uh, who is one of the foremost theoretical computer scientists in the world, winner of the Abel Prize, uh, works at the Institute of Advanced Study. Akshay Venkatesh at the IAS and Terence Tao at UCLA, both of whom are fields medal. Now a little bit about the work of Neeraj. So Neeraj started his career with the Big Bang, already as an undergrad at IIT Kanpur was part of a team led by his uh, advisor, Manindra Agarwal, who solved one of the famous problems uh, in the in number theory and computer science proposed by Gauss more than 200 years ago. It showed that primes is in P, which means they found an efficient way to determine whether a number is prime or not. This work made international headlines and received many prizes and accolades. Manindra Agarwal won the inaugural Infosys Prize in 2008. Neeraj and his, and his advisor, Manindra, are the unique student advisor duo to win the Infosys Prize. The jury act has focused on Neeraj's later work on algebraic complexity after he kind of started his career as a full-fledged independent researcher. His work is motivated by the holy grail of computer science, namely the P versus NP problem. So Neeraj's career kind of work, after showing in his work as an undergrad, that a hard problem around since Gauss was easy in a technical sense, in the sense there was an efficient algorithm find its solution, Neeraj's later work has focused on trying to prove that the problems which are widely considered as hard are indeed hard. In fact, this is incredibly hard to do. The P versus NP problem is one of the clay $1 million problems announced at the start of the millennium. So what is this P versus NP problem? Given a problem, one would like to know the efficiency of algorithms which can solve the problem. The class of problems NP, which is part of this dichotomy in this problem, are problems for which a solution can be checked efficiently, technically in polynomial time. A class of problems, P, which is a subset of these problems, are those problems for which one can find a solution easily in polynomial time. It is widely expected that P is not equal to NP. Right? So not all problems should be easy. But no one has been able to show this. So what, what is an example of a problem which is supposed to be difficult, which no one can show is difficult? Uh, it's, for example, the uh, problem related to what Neeraj did in terms of his work on finding algorithms to determine whether a number is prime, just ask instead, how can, is there an efficient way to factor an integer? Right? Suppose you're given a very large integer. Uh, can you factor it into its prime factorization? That problem is widely expected to be a problem, which is an NP problem. So one does not expect an efficient algorithm to do this. This is not known. If it turns out to be in P, it will make the currently used internet security port protocols, which rely on the RSA method, insecure. While determining if an integer is prime is in P, uh, so while determining if an integer is prime is a problem which uh, there is an algorithm for, a deterministic efficient algorithm, factoring integers is widely believed to be in NP. That's supposed to be a hard problem. Again, no one can prove, prove this. So this might sound a bit strange that showing that a hard problem is indeed hard, uh, you know, uh, may sound to be only of theoretical interest, 
But I, but imagine if we are thinking of a problem that we think is hard, but can't be sure it is hard. Then we might wonder if the problem is genuinely hard and beyond the of our, our, our resources uh, available to us, or one is not being clever enough. Right? So if someone can actually tell you that the problem is hard, you can kind of uh, move to something else. So knowing for sure a problem is hard is indeed very, very useful. So Neeraj has come as close as anyone to solving an algebraic analog of the problem known as VP versus VNP. So that, but the, Neeraj's work is not all about uh, gloom and doom in terms of trying to find and show hard problems are hard. This problem has had uh, more optimistic, positive applications. And recent work with Chandan Saha and Ankit Gar, Neeraj has used his work to give reconstruction algorithms. And there are problems, there are promising applications of the offering related to natural language learning. So I would now like to invite Neeraj to uh, come and say a few words. Thank you, Professor Kare, and uh, thank you to the Infosys uh, Foundation. I want to acknowledge my long-term collaborator, Chindan Saha. This journey of exploration and discovery uh, could not have been possible without you and would not have been fun without you. I have been fortunate uh, during my research career. Uh, thank you, Avi, Manindra, Eric, Satya, and Sriram for your guidance encouragement and patience. I want to thank my family for their support, uh, my sister uh, Mita and my daughter Yudhika. In times of difficulty, I found solace in my uh, sis sister Smita's inspirational work caring for cancer patients. Finally, I want to say that the uh, award is really a recognition of our large number of advances uh, in al algebraic complexity, uh, some of which have come out of India and uh, uh, that I've been a part of. Uh, thank you, Shubhangi, Sebastian, Ram Prasad, Srikanth, and Ankit for contributing so much to our joint works and for more generally for advancing the field itself. Uh, I really do think that uh, India will keep contributing significantly to this field, especially after this award. Uh, it should encourage everyone in this field to do even better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dinesh. Thank you, Professor Khare. And congratulations, Dr. Neeraj Kaur. Congratulations, Dr. Neeraj. Congratulations. Neeraj. Thank you. Congratulations to Dr. Kyle, and you know, I must thank Professor Curry for decoding us. Well, I really hope that each one of you in the comfort of your homes is applauding the amazing work that each one of our laureates have accomplished. And while we might not be, you know, physically together today, research continues unabated in our next category, physical sciences. And to introduce the jury chair for the physical sciences, it is my pleasure to invite the anchor trustee for this category, Mr. S. Gopalakrishnan. Mr. Gopalakrishnan, I hand the floor back to you. Thank you, Deepak. It's my privilege to introduce you to the jury chair of the Infosys Prize in Physical Sciences, Professor Srinivas Kulkarni. Srinivas Kulkarni has been an anchor juror from the beginning of the Infosys Science Foundation, starting from 2009. 
He is the George Ellery Hill Professor of Astronomy and Planetary Sciences at Caltech. His primary interests are in the study of cosmic explosions, neutron stars, and developing new methodologies for astronomical research. He is known for the discovery of the first millisecond pulsar, the first brown dwarf, and showing that gamma ray bursts are of extra galactic origin. His notable awards include the Alan T. Waterman Prize of the U.S. National Science Foundation, the Helen B. Warner Award of the American Astronomical Society, and the Jansky Prize of Associated Universities Incorporated. Now I request Professor Kulkarni to announce the Infosys Prize winner in the Physical Sciences category. The ambit of the Physical Sciences Prize is vast, from fundamental physics to astronomy with geology, chemistry, and paleontology in between. This of Sir Tejinder Virdi of Imperial College, United Kingdom, Milind Purohit, Dean Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, Japan, Rana Adhikari, Professor of Physics, California Institute of Technology, Subhi Sachdev, Harvard University, Ajay Sood, Indian Institute of Science, Bengaluru. Our panel unanimously chose Professor Bedangadas Mohanty of NICER as this year's winner in the physical sciences. The formal citation reads as follows. The Infosys Prize in Physical Sciences Award to Bedangadas Mohanty for investigation of the nuclear force at the Brookhaven National Laboratory and the European Organization for Nuclear Research, he determined the transition temperature of the quark gluon plasma to hadronic matter, observed heavy antimatter nuclei, observed nuclear spin orbital angular momentum interactions and other effects in quark gluon plasma. Okay, uh, let me give you some background. The matter we see around us in ordinary life, you know, the skin, the air I breathe, maybe the chair I'm sitting on, they primarily consist of molecules, solids. But if you look into it, ultimately, the, the matter has basically, in any bit, there's a nucleus, which is in turn made of neutrons and protons and surrounded by a cloud of electrons. So if you look at just say an oxygen atom it's got eight protons, eight neutrons in the center as a nucleus, and 16 electrons buzzing around. Particle a physicist working with accelerators, as well as some amazing mathematical formulation of laws of nature, have now established that these particles that we experience in our ordinary life are actually composite particles they in turn are made of truly fundamental particles, which come in two varieties, fermions, uh, which are made up in turn in two families, quarks and leptons. So for example, an electron is a lepton. Quarks is something you don't see in real life because it's uh, the, our, the life, we, you know, we are what is called as a low energy life. And bosons, uh, which are uh, consist of gauge particles and Higgs, the famed Higgs particle. So the result is ultimately the, all the particles, all the matter we see maps into these 17 particles that you combine in different ways, like a Lego set to make different things. I find this really, really astonishing. Uh, I would say it's, I salute my particle physics friends and theorists that we can now understand the absolute constituent basis of the universe, both in terms of energy and in matter. Now, there is, it's a curious thing that these resulting 17 particles have a antimatter counterpart. That is for every 
quark, there's an anti-quark. A lepton, there's an anti-lepton. So you may have heard of electron and anti-electron, it's usually called a positron. Proton, anti-proton. Okay. Um, so it's uh, after being astonished that the last 60 seconds can now explain not just these particles, but also the force between them. Uh, weak interaction, now this important radioactivity, electromagnetic, of course, we experience all the time. Your cell phone won't work if it isn't there. Nuclear forces, which you know, it's the basis of nuclear power, nuclear bombs. Okay, with this background, I think we are ready to now talk about the topic related to our winners research. When the universe began, as you know, it took the Big Bang, it was extremely hot. It was so hot that the matter, which I said consists of these basic particles, had completely dissolved into the constituent particles. And the resulting glue, you know, the resulting gas or plasma is called as the quark gluon plasma, okay? <clears throat> which are basically particles and their force particles just mixed together. As the universe expanded, it cooled and the quark gluon plasma transformed to ordinary particles. So for the first time in the universe, you start getting protons, a little later the electrons, sorry, uh, protons, electrons, a little later the neutron. And then these things start interacting and form hydrogen, helium, and that's how the universe begins. Okay, then there's a long process of astronomical progress where stars take the hydrogen helium and start building up the periodic process through stellar fusion processes, including supernovae, okay? So the temperature at which this transition from the fundamental soup, the quark gluon plasma, to ordinary matter, that temperature for this transition is an absolutely fundamental quantity. And there has been a concerted effort to measure the temperature of the, it's called the phase transition temperature for gluon plasma to ordinary matter. Our winner, Professor Mohanty, expanded our understanding of the strong nuclear force. He's a leader in the STAR experiment of, at the Brookhaven National Laboratory and the ALICE experiment, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. From these measurements, Professor Mohanty measured the temperature at which this transition happens and elucidated various other physical properties of the quark gluon plasma, for which we have many theoretical ideas. But ultimately in science, theory has to be measured and reality has to be confirmed with measurements and observations. In addition to this great achievement, I would say, Professor Mohanty was the first to observe heavier than hydrogen nuclei made of antimatter. I already talked of proton, anti-proton, electron, anti-electron or positron. But uh, how about other anti-matter things? Well, he was the first to observe heavier than hydrogen nuclei, so more complex. So it takes, uh, now you have to understand that when matter and antimatter particles meet instantly, it's converted to energy. So it's not something you can actually just go around to assemble an antimatter. It's, it takes a lot of cleverness. He was the first to observe the formation of quark gluon plasma fluid with the largest known vorticity. He studied the physics of particle production mechanisms, fragmentation processes, and pattern energy losses in the quark gluon plasma medium. Finally, our panel noted his contribution to search for fractionally charged particles and disoriented chiral condensates. So it's one of these things where, you know, now that we have to understand this transition, we can do a lot of tests of what, how exactly this transition happens. So that's sort of really, you know, fundamental work. I'd like to conclude by saying there's still a big mystery left. Why is that our current universe has only matter, but not antimatter? That is when we look around, you know, I'm made of matter, you're made of matter. The ne galaxy next to us is made of matter. In fact, we are assured, for, I can't go in detail, that almost all the universe in the matter in the universe is matter. How did it, when, why did the universe choose matter or antimatter? This is a fundamental choice the universe made for what is otherwise exactly equal. 
perhaps Professor Mohanty can now, having won the Infosys Prize, focus on this puzzle next. I'd be really curious to know the answer to that. Congratulations, Professor Mohanty, for this prize, truly well-deserved. I now invite you to say a few words. Thank you, Professor Srinivas Kulkarni, for the kind words. I am delighted to get this prize and really feel honored to become part of such a distinguished list of laureates. Thanks to the Infosys Science Foundation for supporting basic science research in the country. Special thanks to the jury members whose work I highly respect for finding my work worthy of this prestigious recognition as you heard Professor Kulkarni so beautifully put it in his words. Thanks to the peers and the nominators for being convinced about the work we do and its scientific findings. I have dominantly worked in large collaborations of institutes and countries. The work would not have been possible without my collaborators in the experiments. Star experiment at Brookhaven National Laboratory, Alice at CERN, and Super I am thankful to my students, postdoctoral fellows, my institute, NICER, and the Indian funding agencies, BAE and DST, for their continued support. Each piece of the work demands dedication and time. It was not possible without the sacrifice and support of my mother, my late father, my wife, and my daughter. And most importantly, blessings of my teachers. This recognition has inspired me to continue my research from India to further our understanding of fundamental matter we are all made and the forces that hold them together. I will certainly try to look at matter antimatter search, which Professor Kulkarni suggested. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kulkarni. Thank you, Mr. Gopal Krishnan, and congratulations, Professor Mohanty. Wasn't that just a fabulous masterclass in physics from Professor? Thank you, sir, for decoding the work of Professor Mohanty. They say a physicist is just an atom looking at itself. <laughs> we move on to the next category, and this is in social sciences. To introduce the jury chair for social sciences, it is my pleasure to invite the anchor trustee for this category, and the chairman of Aaron Capital Partners, Mr. Mohandas Pai. Welcome to the program, Mr. Pai, and I hand the floor to you. Uh, thank you very much. Folks, I'm privileged to introduce you the jury chair of the Infosys Prize in Social Sciences, Professor Kaushik Basu. Professor Kaushik Basu, C. Marks, Professor at Cornell, Chief Economist, and the Chief Advisor for the Government of India. In 2008, in 2017, he became President of the International Economic Association. 
Our long association with Professor Kaushik Basu as chair of the jury goes back a way, way long time. I request Professor Basu to announce the Infosys Prize winner in the social prizes. Over to Professor Basu. Thank you, Mr. Mohundas Pai. The winner of the Infosys Prize 2021 for the social sciences is Pratiksha Bakshi of the Center for the Study of Law and Governance at JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University. The award is a recognition of Pratiksha Bakshi's pioneering work on sexual violence and jurisprudence. She has done extraordinary ethnographic research to shed light on gendered violence. Her research spans several disciplines by combining legal studies, sociology, and anthropology. She has profoundly influenced a growing field of inquiry into the social life of the law. Her book, Public Secrets, Rape Trials in India, is an ethnograph ethnography of courts and communities involved in adjudicating rape. The landmark study set a new standard in feminist legal sociology and anthropology. Her work has profoundly influenced a growing field of interdisciplinary inquiry where the law is itself the subject of inquiry. In addition to this research, by establishing what is called LASSNET, the Law and Social Sciences Research Network, she has nurtured a valuable dialogue between academics, activists, and lawyers. Pratiksha Bakshi has the rare distinction of being a sociologist whose writings have been cited in court judgments, legal textbooks, and judicial commission reports. My work as chair of the jury was supported by an outstanding cast of jury members. They were Amita Bhaviskar from Ashoka University and one of the early winners of the Infosys Prize, Rajiv Bhargav of the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, whose research spans all the social sciences. Gopal Krishna Gandhi, now professor at Ashoka University and former governor of West Bengal. Neeraja Gopal Jayal, professor at JNU and distinguished scholar on democracy and governance. Andrew Wilford of Cornell University, my colleague and an internationally renowned anthropologist. I am grateful to the jury for making the jury duty more pleasure than work. I also want to thank the team of Infosys Science Foundation that helped us with outstanding professionalism. I have worked in many countries, many places, but let me emphasize outstanding. Friends, human welfare depends on many things, but in the long run, nothing is as important as scientific breakthroughs and intellectual creativity for taking a nation forward. 15th and 16th century Italy, 18th and 19th century United Kingdom, 20th and 21st century United States are testimony to this. These Infosys prizes are a celebration of this creativity and as such, they can play a critical role in India's advance. Finally, Patiksha, let me wish you personally, I had last seen you when you were a student at the Delhi School of Economics when I was a professor there. I can't tell you what pleasure it was to see the range of your awesome, I'm using a very American expression, <laughs> awesome contributions. Your work dares us to strive for a better society in India and everywhere in the world. Congratulations, Patiksha. We wait to hear your words of acceptance.
Thank you, uh, Professor Basu, for your very, very generous uh, words. And it's such a delight to meet you at this platform again after so many years. I'd like to thank the Infosys Science Foundation and the jury who I hold in very high esteem for thinking of my scholarship as worthy of this honor. Thank you also so much for recognizing GlassNet, a collective effort at finding creativity in the I feel most humbled today. I hope that this recognition dedicated to our common cause to end sexual violence will inspire greater support for feminist research on sexual violence in the future. My scholarship would not have been possible without the support of my family, and I'd especially like to acknowledge my parents, Prema and Upendra, and many thanks also to Vipla and Sambhav. My friends believed in me, even when skepticism found me, and this recognition affirms the power of their friendship. I must also say that I'm very grateful to my supervisors, teachers, and colleagues at the Delhi School of Economics, where I first learned uh, what academic autonomy actually was. And today, when we struggle to conserve academic freedom globally, I thank my distinguished colleagues at the Center for the Study of Law and Governance and at the Jawaharlal Nehru University for being such a force of inspiration, solidarity, and courage. To all my students, thank you for excelling in your work. I hope to find the courage to continue to research and write without fear and without shame. Thank you so much for this honor. Thank you, Professor Basu. Thank you, Mr. Pai. And congratulations, Professor Bakshi. Well, that was the last category for this evening. Our warmest congratulations to every one of our laureates in this, their moment of pride. And now, may I call upon the founder of Infosys and trustee of the Infosys Science Foundation, Mr. N. R. Naranamurthy, to deliver his special remarks on science. Good evening, Mr. Murthy. Welcome to the program, and I hand the floor to you. Thank you, Deepa. A progressive society honors its intellectuals, values them, creates a climate of their flourishing, and makes their life comfortable. The purpose of the Infosys Prize is to add its own bit to this important task of our country. Our winners have solved some of the toughest problems as we have just heard. The latest that I can speak about is Professor Manjul Bhargav who proved just the last month in November 2021, the 1936 conjecture of when there were then. This problem lay unsolved for over 85 years. Let me congratulate the winners of the Infosys Prize 2021. Scientists study the world as it is, ponder about its anomalies, discover the reasons for these anomalies, and usher in new ideas and theories. The engineers, on the other hand, use these ideas to create a world that never was. The social scientists make living in this world meaningful. The artists make our life enjoyable. Adi Shankara's Advaita Vedanta, Vedanta 
and Immanuel Kant's The Critic of Pure Reason, Brahma Gupta's Invention of Zero, Adam Smith's Invisible Hand, Will and Ariel Durand's The Story of Civilization, Freud's work on psychoanalysis, Vyasa's work on Mahabharata, and Guido de Arezzo's work on musical notation for Western classical music. All good examples of great minds at work in philosophy, mathematics, economics, history, psychology, and music. The theory of relativity, quantum mechanics, Maxwell's electromagnetic theory, Alan Turing and von Neumann's work on computers, Claude Shannon's work on information theory, Tim Berners-Lee's work on World Wide Web, and Alfred Berthiem, Paul Ehrlich, and Alexander Fleming's work on penicillin, to name just a few scientific and engineering ideas are some of the most impactful examples of the power of great minds at work in physical sciences, mathematics, computing and engineering, and life sciences. India has made laudable progress in using science and engineering ideas to advance our country. However, several grand challenges remain. Let me mention just three. Our air is toxic and unfit for breathing in many places. We have serious shortage of portable water. We are yet to design vaccines for dengue and chikungunya. What are the solutions? There are two solutions. First is to create an environment of high aspiration, positivity, enthusiasm, full academic freedom, and humility among our researchers. The second is to bring a competent, transparent, and accountable bureaucracy with a focus on speed of action. Let me focus just on the first issue. The students of electrical engineering and CS, there are many here, revere Professor Richard Hamming, who developed the coding theory and the famous Hamming code. Professor Richard Hamming, in his scholarly book, the art of doing science and engineering has spoken about the importance of developing a certain style of thinking among youngsters to do research work and to solve important problems. That detailed discussion is for another day. What is style? Style is working on the right problem at the right time in the right way to solve a grand problem. The best way to develop such a style among the youngsters, according to Professor Richard Hamming, is to create an environment of aspiration to solve important problems, courage, self-belief, desire for excellence, open-mindedness, ability to invert the problem and solve perhaps a grander problem, sustained intellectual investment, pluralism, curiosity, hard work, ability to tolerate ambiguity, discussion, debate, cross-discipline orientation, critical thinking, acceptance of one's failure, appreciation of those that perform, that perform better than us, and the ability to applaud truth, no matter how far our stand is from it. The ability to applaud truth based on data and facts is what distinguishes our chief guest of the day, Professor Gagandeep Kang. She has become the definitive and authentic voice 
on the COVID-19 vaccine issue. Uh, words have er earned much confidence amongst the cognoscenti of our land. Any interminable discussion on COVID-19 comes to an end when somebody says, Professor Kang has said it. She is a well-known Indian microbiologist and virologist. She is a professor of virology and gastrointestinal sciences at the Christian Medical College, Bellu. She has won several awards. I will just mention two. We are proud that she won the Infosys Prize for Life Sciences in 2016. She is the first Indian woman to be elected to the Royal Society UK. Friends, I have great pleasure to present you Professor Gagandeep Khan. Ten-year-old Gagandeep's first choice was to become an air hostess, a dream that landed almost as quickly as it took flight. But her pursuit of science, a subject she loved in school, resulted in her becoming a leading virologist, the development of two WHO-approved rotavirus vaccines, and being recognized as India's vaccine queen. She pursued her MBBS, MD and PhD at Christian Medical College, Vellore, a place that was as pivotal in her career as it was special in her life, because it was also where she met her husband and delivered their two sons. During her postdoctoral training abroad and through conversations with her role model, mentor, and now peer, Professor Mary Estes, Kang realized that she wanted to impact the community as a whole, not one patient at a time, and returned to her beloved alma mater to begin her journey as a career scientist. Dr. Kang's opinions on vaccines are sought after world over, especially during the COVID-19 crisis. She is considered the voice of reason and science in India, was outspoken about her views about how the pandemic was being managed, and never shied from calling a spade, a spade. Bold not just in words, but also in action. Dr. Kang created history as the first Indian woman to be elected a Fellow of the Royal Society and the Fellowship of the American Academy of Microbiology. She garnered numerous distinguished accolades and achievements in her vast repertoire, including the Infosys Prize in Life Sciences, she has always advocated for a supportive ecosystem to encourage more women in science. Dr. Kang attributes her success to her very supportive family, who always encouraged her to follow her dreams. Her professors, mentors, colleagues, friends, and well-wishers at CMC Velour, India's robust education system that shaped her mind and honed her skills and the external exposure that built her confidence and helped her realize her potential. She has come a long way from being the young girl who did science experiments in her at-home lab for fun, and even after 20 years as an icon for scientists and scientific thought in society, Dr. Gagandeep Kang continues to blaze trails with her trademark honesty, humility, and grace as she keeps the flame of curiosity burning just as bright. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction and for the privilege of addressing you here at this prestigious event. And congratulations to all of the laureates. I think last week you might have heard of Omicron, a variant that kind of took over the news cycle. We started counting cases, countries, describing what different governments were doing. And it seemed much like the early days of the pandemic where every form of media and every individual turned into a tracker. But actually a lot has changed over the past 23 months. And most recently, the example of that is what South Africa was able to do with Omicron being able to sequence it and analyze those sequences to show that it had mutations in number and location 
that predicted potential worrying changes in the behavior of the virus. The COVID-19 pandemic has ruled our lives with ups and downs and restrictions and regulations and advances and setbacks in medicine and in science. And we've had a flood of information where it has been difficult to understand what is false, what is conjecture, what is imperfectly clear and what is certain, at least at that point in time. This pandemic is the most measured and most tracked event in human history. And science, as much as politics and policy, has played a key role. The deluge of data that we've had from the spread of the virus in humans and in animals, the clinical consequences of infection, the pathology of disease, virus genomics, treatment approaches, the safety, the efficacy, the impact of vaccines, all of this to expand, even as our ability to analyze and interpret the data evolves. But the sheer volume of information that we have is not necessarily an immediate explanation of why we are where we are, much less what the future might hold. In a chaotic system, when we deal with new circumstances, there is a limit to accurate prediction about next waves, about the danger of new variants or the long term effectiveness of new vaccines. And when scientists try to convey the limits of our current understanding or uncertainty about what the future might hold, they actually struggle to be heard over the authoritative and authoritarian voices that come from those that advocate for unproven traditional remedies at one end to the bypassing of due process from a misplaced sense of patriotism at the other. It seems difficult today for any science regarding the pandemic to be apolitical, and perhaps the swings between excessive deference and excessive skepticism are a consequence of how our society functions. Nonetheless, the current pandemic has resulted in an increased awareness of science in society, even though what constitutes scientific expertise and credibility is viewed through different lenses by different audiences. This polarization and the attendant conspiracy theories are not unique to India. And it's actually interesting for me that while Indian and Asian cultures in the 20th and 21st centuries have recognized the necessity of science as a means of individual announcement advancement, collectively somehow we seem to hold different views. Whether it is the IITs or IISC, the brightest students have traditionally been directed to science, and those individuals in India and globally have shown their caliber in the application of science and technology in great measure, but not necessarily in discovery at quite the same level. The importance of the application of science was highlighted by the government of India in 1958 in its scientific policy resolution, which stated the dominating feature of the contemporary world is the intense cultivation of science on a large scale and its application to meet a country's requirement. Further, when the fundamental duties were added to the constitution of India in 1976 through Article 51A, the eighth duty stated, it shall be the duty of every citizen of India to develop the scientific temper, humanism, and spirit of inquiry and reform, making our constitution one of the few that requires this as a funda fundamental foundational aspect of our society. The term scientific temper is often attributed to Jawaharlal Nehru, but was first used in the 19th century by a Jesuit scholar. Bertrand Russell used it in 1922 to describe the acceptance of the theory of rel relativity by the world as an example of true scientific temper. 
Essentially, Einstein's theory upset the theoretical framework of traditional physics, and yet physicists were ready to accept it as soon as the evidence was in its favor. Yet the theory wasn't considered the last word. To quote Russell, he has not built a monument of infallible dogma to stand for all time. There are difficulties he cannot solve. His doctrines will have to be modified in their turn as they have modified Newton's. This critical undogmatic receptiveness is the true attitude of science. While Russell's description of scientific temper referred to the scientific commun community, Nehru actually brought that framing to society, and I quote, the scientific temper points out the way along which man should travel. It is the temper of a free man. We live in a scientific age, so we are told, but there is little evidence of this temper in the people anywhere or even their leaders. What is needed is the scientific approach, the adventurous yet critical temper of science, the search for truth and new knowledge, the refusal to accept anything without testing and trial, the capacity to change previous conclusions in the face of new evidence, the reliance on observed fact and not on preconceived theory, the hard discipline of the mind. All this is necessary, not merely for the application of science, but for life itself and the solution of its many problems. For researchers, this direction of travel, of being skeptical, of evaluating their data and tracking back to test its integrity and plausibility, the refusal to test or accept anything which has not been tried. This has been lacking or limited in the past two years whether it is the need, the timing, the mechanisms of lockdown, the approach to testing, the evaluation of drugs developed by national agencies, or treatment protocols that included drugs like hydroxychloroquine a year after they had been shown to be clearly ineffective. But perhaps this has actually been a missed opportunity for scientists and for policymakers that do believe in the essentiality of a scientific temper in society. When newspapers track numbers and try to decipher what they mean for the present and the future, this is actually an opportunity for the communication of the value of science and a way to counter the challenges that are brought up about by a lack of scientific temper as a way of life that questions and analyzes data. This need was recognized by many people's science movements in the 1970s, similar to the Kerala Shastra Sahitya Parishad, which was established in 1962. Many of these movements have faded since then and need to be reinvigorated. This issue of escape into magical beliefs and instant solutions, as Raja Ramana said, was and is recognized by scientists, but channels of communication between scientists and society remain limited, reflected in the widespread of disinformation about the pandemic and the burgeoning of belief in unproven methods of treatment. For science to be trusted and valued, we have to move beyond the employment opportunities of an IIT graduate and understand that there can be no division between science and society. In the past few centuries, in this pandemic, and certainly in the future, the history of the world has been and will be shaped by the countries that lead in science and intellectual exploration. For any nation and society, world leading science is a matter of prestige and a contribution to excellence, not only in the country, but to the world. Science will be trusted and will serve us best if it accords with the principles of transparency, openness, and very importantly, inclusivity. In our society and in our scientific institutions, we have too often and for far too long 
had blind spots that have ignored caste, creed, and gender. We need not only to ensure that we recognize our biases and restrictions in the way that we lean, deal with lines of research and in the ways that policy which affects all of us without necessarily considering all of us. Again, there can be no division between science and society. The most urgent scientific and technological needs of our society during the pandemic, such as tests, drugs, and vaccines, as well as the most basic and fundamental scientific lines of inquiry emanate from a social fabric and time with its attitudes, needs, and limitations. As a society, can we survive without scientific temper? It is, of course, feasible in an interconnected world that allows for expertise, production, and services, not always needing to be co-located where the requirement is. But as a nation and a society that visualizes the humane, inclusive, and environmentally sound future that is embodied in the Sustainable Development Goals, as a nation and a society that seeks to develop our ability to empower our citizenry through health and education in preparation for a productive future as a nation and a society that seeks to thrive, we need an understanding, application, communication, and appreciation of the science that supports us in all our goals. Recognition of exploration, innovation, and responses to challenge of sci challenges in science and in society is the goal of the Infosys Prizes. The prizes highlight what and how individuals and the teams they lead have contributed to solving problems in their field and have created the role models of science and scholarship that you saw today. The Infosys Science Foundation goes beyond the prizes to create the opportunities for sharing the journey of exploration, the many failures, occasional triumphs, and the value of both those experiences. It seeks to change the environment around critical thought and exploration, and that is essential to our world today. Thank you once again for the privilege of sharing in the recognition of the accomplishments of the Infosys laureates today. Thank you, Dr. Kang, for those very thought-provoking remarks and for challenging the scientific community. We've all been enthralled every time we hear you speak, and I think the guidance you're giving to young researchers around the world is sure to inspire them. Thank you once again. Well, we're almost at the end of this event, and I would now like to call upon the Chief Executive Officer of Infosys, Mr. Salil Parekh, to deliver a vote of thanks. Welcome to the program, Mr. Parekh, and I hand the floor to you. Thanks, Deepak. Good evening and good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us for this outstanding Infosys Prize event. The stories of the prize awardees are truly inspiring and hopefully drive us to bring out the best in the service of society. One of the most remarkable things about the past several months has been the incredible journey of science and the shining of the human spirit. With all the progress we have seen around the world, I am more optimistic about the future than ever before. Congratulations to the winners of the Infosys Prize. They have created remarkable progress and breakthrough across different fields. 
as we have seen around the world, societies that have listened more to science and common sense have fared better in the recent past. It is for us to keep that in mind as we support the Infosys Prize winners and their work in the years ahead. The government of India has been supportive of such work and the prize specifically, making the purse of the Infosys Prize tax-free in India. My thanks to the jury chairs for selecting winners of this caliber. These individuals will make long lasting impact across the chosen areas of expertise. Thank you to the jury members who have joined us from across the globe. Each panel headed by expert chairs holds the work of our nominees to exacting standard selecting the most impactful. Our chief guest, Professor Gagandeep Khan, is an embodiment of fundamental work applying science to daily life, contributing to society, and the very spirit of the Infosys Prize. It was really inspiring to hear you speak today and to give that message that is so relevant for all of us here at this ceremony and across the country. Thank you to the trustees of the Infosys Science Foundation for instituting this Infosys Prize. With each year, we are seeing the increasing impact of the Infosys Science Foundation in the form of the work and the leadership of the Infosys Prize winners. This event, the Infosys Prize lectures, and other initiatives enable us to showcase the stellar research and scholarship of the Infosys Prize winners to the world. Infosys is privileged to support the Infosys Science Foundation. Thank you to the Infosys Science Foundation team, Bhavna, Nidhi, Swati, Ajay, and Hana, not just for this evening, but for the entire year of work behind the Infosys Prize and these events. Thanks to Deepak for being our MC tonight. And thanks to everyone else who has helped behind the teams in putting together such an incredible event. With that, we close the event for today. I look forward to seeing you all in person at our event for next year. Take care and stay safe. Thank you, Salil, for those closing remarks. Indeed, this event has been a culmination of many, many months of hard work and effort from everyone at the Infosys Science Foundation, the trustees, and the juries. Well, all that's left for me is to say thank you to each one of you for spending this time with us. Until we meet again, stay safe and stay curious. Thank you.